So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Vermont Nonprofit Summit. I am Emma Paradise, Manager of Policy and Strategic Initiatives here at Common Good Vermont, which is a statewide program of United Way of Northwest Vermont. And on behalf of all of our team, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. We have been so amazed by the level of interest in this convening that far exceeded our expectations. We sold out more than a month before the event, but are grateful to have the opportunity to bring together so many members of our nonprofit community for a day of education and learning and connection. We look forward to growing this event in years to come to bring together even more organizations and allies to celebrate the strength and unity of our sector. And on that note, I want to take a moment to thank those who have made this event possible, our incredible sponsors. First, our champion sponsor, the Vermont Community Foundation. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'd like to thank our advocate sponsors, the Vermont Community Loan Fund, our team here at the United Way of Northwest Vermont, and Tuck Consulting Group. And we want to give a special shout out to Tuck Consulting, who has donated their time and project management expertise to helping us plan and execute this summit. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, we'd love to thank our ally sponsors, Amata Vita Solutions, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Northern New England Chapter, Efficiency Vermont, Gallagher, Flynn and Company, Inner Citadel Consulting, Intentional Evolution, Jen Hazlett Coaching and Consulting, Lawson's Finest Liquids, Leaves of Change, Lund, Quick Start, The Richards Group, University of Vermont's Office of Engagement and Leahy Institute for Rural Partnerships, Weston and Sampson, and your part-time controller. Thank you all. We couldn't have done it without you. We also want to give you a warm welcome to the state capitol. Um, while you're here today, we invite you to take some time after the summit to show some love to our local businesses, peruse the shops, or grab a bite to eat at one of our restaurants, recognizing that Montpelier is still in economic recovery after the floods. I'd also like to thank Katie Trouts and Montpelier Alive for providing maps and brochures to help you get oriented, as well as for loading us their equipment for the summit. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, before we dive in, um, we're going to go over a few logistics. Um, so after our opening remarks and our panel discussion this morning, we'll head into our first breakout sessions. Uh, our breakout sessions are on three floors of the hotel, um, and you can see your program for the map, as well as breakout locations and descriptions. Um, and more information can be found online on our summit website. After our first breakout, we'll come back here to the ballroom for lunch, and during this time, we really encourage you to spend some time visiting our exhibitors at their tables. Um, learn about their work and how they can support you and yours. After lunch, we'll break out into our community of practice sessions um, where you can connect with peers in similar roles. Uh, the locations for those are also in the program and there's a sheet in your folder as well with those descriptions. And then we'll close out the day with our second and final breakout session. If you need anything throughout the day, our wonderful team of staff members can be identified by their shirts and their name tags, so please don't hesitate to ask if you need anything. Uh, and then finally, some important information, restrooms, there are several. Uh, some are down the hallway to the right and a sharp left. There are more off the lobby. The women's are up the stairs, men's down the stairs. Um, and I think there's a couple more if you head straight that way. So feel free to ask if you need help finding those. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Jesse Bridges, CEO of United Way Northwest Vermont, to the stage. Thank you, Jesse. Good morning. 
What a crowd. This is exceptional. Uh, how about another round of applause for Emma? <laughs> and really, the whole team at Common Good. Um, we're really, thank you for being here, and thank you to them for, for putting this on. I am, I've been talking to a number of people, and I'm just stunned. I continue to be stunned, one, with the execution, but two, that this is the first. Um, and I can tell by the turnout, I can tell by the fact we sold this thing out like a month ago, uh, that the demand is there. Um, we all really yearn to get together and connect, um, and so that's a really uh, powerful opportunity that we have in front of us. This is a defining moment for Vermont's nonprofit sector. Uh, from arts and human services to education and environment, our focuses are broad, but our missions are aligned. We all know we can't do this work alone. Each of us plays a critical role in improving our communities. Looking at how our organizations shared resources, people, and responsibility during COVID, multiple floods, during the current and ongoing issue of the state's housing crisis. We've used the arts to engage, peer support to recover, and technology to innovate our environmental and programmatic response. And this sector is not just about doing good either. We are a critical component of Vermont's workforce and economy. Recently updated Department of Labor statistics now show that one in five Vermont workers is employed by a nonprofit. That's 20% of our workforce, and it's a 6% increase. For those who have been around for a minute, you, or have heard me talk, you've heard me say one in seven for a while now. Um, I think it's really showing, one, what our communities are needing, it's also showing the vibrancy uh, and growth that our organizations have taken in order to support the people that are doing the work as much as we support the work itself. And that's why we need organizations like Common Good. We need organizations like Common Good to advocate for us. We need them to provide technical assistance to us. And we need them to educate us for the future. Our people, and our work are too important to ignore, underfund, and undervalue. We need to continue to evolve the sector's pay and benefits. Our recent wage and benefits survey shows progress, but too many nonprofits continue to struggle to provide pay, make payroll, and provide benefits to our people and what they deserve. I'll close by saying too often in today's political and media climate, no, not you, Michaela. To hear, we, we hear tale of problems. We hear what doesn't work. What's wrong with our state, our cities, our towns, our people. Today, we have an opportunity to start to change that narrative. Because what I see before me, and what is out there, and the thousands of Vermonters who believe in mission-focused work, is that our solutions are working. We need to continue to focus on what's working, to continue investing in our community's best. Sure, we need to continue to evolve and innovate. We also need other sectors, for-profit, government, education, healthcare, to do their part. United is the way we can ensure everyone in Vermont has a chance to thrive. I ask for each of us to unite for the common good, to continue to learn, grow, and evolve together to meet the needs of Vermonters. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your work uh, ongoing. Thank you. An incredibly important part of our, our vibrant nonprofit economy, I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Holly Morehouse uh, from the Vermont Community Foundation. Hi, everyone. Um, I am incredibly excited to be here. This has been a long time coming um, to have a convening like this. And huge thanks uh, to the team um, at uh, United Way um, and at Common Good for pulling this together, and to all of you, um, executive directors, staff, volunteers, board members, funders, um, all supporting and working in the nonprofit space. Um, for this morning, I was asked to talk a little bit about, you know, what are people talking about in philanthropy and, 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 and on the funder side? And I have a long background on the nonprofit side, so I, I'm flipping that. 
And I'm saying, I'm, I would love to share what I wish they were talking about or hope they were talking about more. And even, even further, what I wish and hope that they're talking to you about. Um, so I have three wishes uh, for today. My first wish is that your funders and donors are really curious about your partnerships and collaborations. I was on a panel up at UVM a few months ago, and um, the audience and the panel started talking about you know, how do we get government to cross silos and partner better? How do we get municipalities and towns and different organizations to come together? And my honest answer and input was like, why well, have you talked to the nonprofit organizations in your communities? So many times you exist in that space cross-sector, cross-organization, tackling really tough problems, and you I figured out how to do it. And so I, my wish and hope is that your funders, when they ask those questions, um, how many of you seen them on uh, applications or report where it's like, list all your partners, right, or your collaboration, right? I don't want you just listing them. I want you to really be able to talk, and I want them to be curious about how did you make them happen? How did you bring people to the table? How did you work through the tough barriers? How did you figure out those moments where everything was in conflict and yet you got through to the other side? Those are the types of skills and conversations we're gonna to need to have to tackle some of the toughest problems in Vermont, right? Whether it's climate resilience or housing or mental health or rural vitality. Um, so I hope today we deepen those conversations about partnerships and collaborations. My second wish is that funders offer you the space um, and room to really talk about the true costs of doing your work. And Jesse just hit on that. Um, I, you know, so much good has come from trust-based philanthropy, right? To level the playing field and talk about power and privilege and what's appropriate for reporting and so forth. I just want to make sure we don't lose those windows for conversations between you and your funders and donors, so that donors and funders really understand that your health costs are going up 20%. So the $5,000 that they gave you in operating costs five years ago to be giving every year is really, really valuable and it's awesome that it's operating costs. But what it means now is very different than maybe what it meant five years ago. And so how do you have that space to really talk about those true, true costs? Um, I think there's a couple of breakouts uh, that we'll touch on that today, so I'm really excited to see how those conversations go. My third wish is that funders will uh, stick with you, donors and funders will stick with you through the messy spaces. Um, gosh, it feels like it was pre-COVID, so now it feels like a gazillion years ago. Um, but I heard a keynote by uh, Ray McNulty, and he was talking about systems change. He's a former uh, Vermont Education Commissioner. He's a national speaker on uh, school reform and, and systems change. And, and he was talking about how organizations come together and they really want to do good work and they know they need to change. And so they, they map that out and they list out all the things that need to change and they change people's roles and they change processes and they change operations. And as they start, you start moving into those spaces where you're starting to do things differently. People are in those spots where they're half in the old system and they're half in the new system. And then all the naysayers who didn't want change at all start saying, I told you it wasn't going to work. It's a total mess, right? And so people start to back up and they get nervous and they back away from the change. And his point was that's just at the moment where you don't want to back away. You got to push through. And so I hope that your funders and donors are supporting you in those messy spaces and giving you um, in your roles, the uh, confidence to talk about the messy and to push through because real changes we need um, and the different spaces to work on are on that other side. Um, so today in our conversations, I'm hoping we can lift up partnerships and collaborations. I hope we can be honest with each other about the true costs of doing this work. And I hope we can support one another in those messy spaces that really get to the impactful and long lasting change that we're all looking for. So thank you again for being here, um, and uh, we're thrilled uh, to participate and to support this work. And I'm going to pass to Martin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Martin Hahn, and I'm the director of Common Good Vermont, and I am so <laughs> thrilled to be here. Um, I'm going to start by uh, acknowledging and thanking Emma Paradise. From the design of this brochure to inviting the panelists for the keynote this morning, from selecting the menu for lunch to identifying leaders for workshop sessions, all of this has Emma's imprint. And thank you, Emma. I'd also like to recognize Lisa Greffe, 
our exceptionally talented manager of learning and education. Unfortunately, Lisa is not here today, but for a very good reason that she's about to go on parental leave. <laughs> to round out our small but mighty team, Adrian Leaders Dumont is United Way's talented senior communications manager. Adrian. And Magnolia Rice is the brilliant AmeriCorps VISTA member and Common Goods membership coordinator. Magnolia. I started, excuse me, I started at Common Good about a year ago, following in the footsteps of my amazing predecessor, Morgan Webster. We had ambitious goals for 2024. Convene the six month fundraising and development certificate program with Jen Hayslett. Jen, where are you? Convene the five month certificate program in nonprofit management that launched last week. If you've attended the nonprofit management class or have been a, a facilitator, can you raise your hand? Wow. Uh, look around the room. These are people who have benefited from a really exceptional training program and hope you'll, uh, if you have not done it, you'll sign up again next year. We also organized webinars on topics such as neuro-inclusive employment, harnessing the power of AI in our nonprofit workplace, considerations in developing a staff benefits package. We prepare weekly electronic newsletters. Who signs up for our newsletter? It's an awesome, it's an awesome network, isn't it? With job openings, funding opportunities, policy updates, and news of interest to nonprofits. Our goal this year was to get a bill passed by the legislature to begin to reform how the state administers grants and contracts. We were successful up until the last week of the session. As an aside, we will return to the State House in 2025 with all of you to continue our progress in reforming state's contract administration of contracts, the state's administration of grants and contracts. All right, yeah. We convene the first two meetings of the Common Good Advisory Committee. If you're a member of the Advisory Committee, can you raise your hand? So these are the people who are representing you with Common Good to help us understand how we do our work better and moving forward and look forward to ongoing participation from many of you in the room in our Advisory Committee. We held a listening tour around the state to hear your stories about what's happening in your communities and in your organizations. We also planned two events, two activities for October 23rd, 2024, today. Host the first statewide nonprofit summit and to announce that Common Good Vermont will become a membership program, effective today. As of today, we are inviting all of the organizations in this room and those who signed up for, to be on the wait list for this sold out event to join as members of Common Good Vermont. Our membership benefits enrollment begins today. Our membership benefits go live on January 1st, and we invite you to sign up. Our membership program advances Common Good Vermont's mission to strengthen, enhance, and advance nonprofits in Vermont. Membership does come with a fee. It's designed to be affordable for organizations of all sizes. By joining, you will gain access to exclusive resources and discounts tailored to support your capacity building of your organization. Member benefits will evolve over time to meet the changing needs of Vermont's nonprofit sector. The membership program is crucial to sustaining the valuable services and resources that Common Good Vermont provides. I respectfully ask that you join us today. Find out more information, there's a QR code on the inside cover of the front page, which will take you to more information about our membership program and where you can enroll. Thank you for being here. I look forward in anticipation to the rest of the day. Thank you. And now back to you. Thank you, Martin. And before I introduce our keynote panel, I just want to say thank you to Martin as well, whose leadership and willingness to try new creative approaches to our support, work supporting the sector has 
brought so much growth and energy to Common Good Vermont. So thank you, Martin. And now, um, as a member of the next generation of nonprofit leaders, I am always thinking about how to ensure we, as a sector, are here for another 50 plus years. That's why I'm thrilled to introduce today's panel discussion. <laughs> there is no question the world has changed. Whether we are talking about people having their basic needs met, the rising cost of healthcare, the workforce, or the unaffordability of housing, just to name a few, we cannot ignore that the nonprofit sector must also change. A new generation of leaders is emerging, and with it, so too is the question, is it time for us to re-envision our sector? Moderated by Michaela Lefrac, who has won several awards for her work, and is currently the host and senior producer of Vermont Edition, whose stories have been featured nationally on NPR's Morning Edition, All Things Considered, Marketplace, and more, this group of visionary leaders you will hear from today will strive to answer this very question. In fact, it is time to envision today. In fact, is it, in fact, time to re envision today's nonprofit sector? Michaela, I welcome you to the stage, and I thank you, Shabnam, for preparing these remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Emma, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, let me just get my coffee and my timer set up. Um, so as the panel gets settled, um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. As you might have uh, guessed, if you have heard me on the radio asking for money, I also work at a nonprofit. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> um, and I also started out my career not in journalism, but um, I was at AmeriCorps Vista right after college. Uh, I worked for an organization in Oakland, California that helped immigrant and refugee women start small businesses and learn English. It was a really incredible experience, um, and that organization shut down because they ran out of money when the founder left. So this feels... <laughs> very relevant um, to my career, and um, I, I'm just so excited to learn from this panel today. I also just want to take a moment um, to say thank you to all of you for the work you're doing. I've actually interviewed a number of you on Vermont Edition. Um, I've already given out some hugs today and hope to give out a couple more after this panel. Um, but one thing I've learned in my time in Vermont is that the work of the people in this room is holding this state together. I mean, you are keeping people fed and housed and safe when they otherwise would not be. That is incredibly difficult work for many reasons, and you're also trying to hold together your own mental health. Um, so I just want to do one more round of applause for all of you and commend you for the work you're doing for our state. So our panelists have each forged impressive careers in Vermont's nonprofit space, and I'm really excited for all of us to learn from them. I'm gonna do a brief introduction and then pass it over to each of them to give you a little bit more behind the scenes information about their careers. Um, so we will start with Sultana Khan, the Director of Social Change at Mosaic, Washington County's Sexual Violence Prevention and Response Agency. Their goal is to help people heal from sexual and gender-based violence. Dylan Bell is the Operations and Grants Manager at the Mary Johnson Children's Center. It's home to several programs which support children and families in Middlebury, East Middlebury, and Orwell. Samba Diallo is the Executive Director of the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont, based in Brattleboro. They work on HIV prevention and support people with HIV and AIDS. And Shabnam Nolan is the executive director of the King Street Center, a youth development organization in Burlington that serves low-income youth and their families, most of whom are from immigrant and refugee communities. And let's pour one out for Sue Minter, who is under the weather, but gives her regards. Um, so yeah, my first question is, give us the cliff notes of your career. How did you get where you are today? Um, the mic is getting passed. We're going to start, Sama, with you. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. This is so exciting. This is the first one, and just seeing so many people in the room from all across the state. Feels good to be here with all of you. 
and I am Samba Diallo, originally from Mali, West Africa, but now residing in Brattleboro, Vermont, and currently the executive director for the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont, which is a small nonprofit that's been around since 1988, and supporting people who are living with HIV and AIDS, their families, and also prevention and harm reduction, so substance use, overdose outreach, and now going into senior care as well because people are living longer thanks to medicine. So we have a lot of stuff to figure out. And how I got to the AIDS project is through volunteering. I started as a volunteer and they had a small part-time role that happened to run the food pantry. So I started running the food pantry and then the clients started to like me a lot. <laughs> and then Funding also changed, unfortunately, so funding for the food pantry was cut, and the director at that time, instead of letting me go, moved me to the prevention side of the work, so started doing harm reduction work and prevention, because there was more funding for that, and continued doing that for a year and a half or so, and when the director was stepping down, they did a national search. I put my resume in, and I am now the director of the AIDS Project. Thank you. Um, I'm also so happy to be here. I had a bit of a shorter drive. I came from Randolph, so. Um, <laughs> I took a very circuitous route to nonprofit work. Um, I've done lots of things over the course of my career. I was a teacher. Uh, I was a national security correspondent for a really big blog that was sued by Hulk Hogan and yeah. was destroyed. <laughs> That's another story for another day. Um, I've you know, worked in the service industry for a lot of my life, uh, and I'm in recovery, um, and I've been in recovery for about five years, so the work that I'm doing... Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think is true about my journey with nonprofit work is that the nonprofit sector has always felt a little bit of a haven for misfit toys. Um, and I certainly am a misfit toy. Um, and I'm like so grateful to be up on a panel where other people have tattoos. <laughs> that feels so nice. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I started as an organizer and an activist doing, you know, a lot of work for very little money. And I don't, I don't feel like that has necessarily changed. Um, but the mission driven aspect of it has stayed the same. And so I'm, I'm so grateful to be doing this work. I'm really grateful to have found a home at Mosaic. Um, I, I'm, I've been there for about a year and a half and I started right before the flood. Um, so to become a part of this community while we really needed each other has been uh, both a gift and sometimes a curse. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dylan Bell. I do um, a lot of the state and private grants for Mary Johnson Children's Center, as well as the facility and financial oversight. Um, I was chatting with Martin earlier, and I was just sharing how exciting it is that this is the first summit. Um, this is my third year in Vermont, and I had no idea until this year this was the first summit. So um, I'm honored to be here, and so glad we're making that leap. Um, I got here kind of a, a roundabout way. Um, I'm from Maryland. I went to college in Maryland and I worked at a summer camp and a lake in New Hampshire um, in between college semesters. And I just fell in love with the Northeast and you know the mountains and the lifestyle um, and just the tight-knit community that was New Hampshire and is Vermont as well. Um, however, as you all know working in nonprofits, especially just a summer nonprofit, um, it's not gonna pay college tuition. So um, it was constantly keeping my eyes open and Mary Johnson Children's Center was coming out with a new role essentially. Um, and I applied and got it and it allowed me to merge you know, my college background as well as my passion for you know, working with children and families and, and giving them the best outcomes moving forward. Um, so I'm just honored that they were able to give me the flexibility and take a chance. So thank you all for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Shabnam Nolan. I'm the executive director of King Street Center. And 
I, you're in my hometown. I am from Montpelier. Yes, I make the drive all the way over to Burlington every day. Um, but welcome to Montpelier. Do you not hear me? Okay. So I feel like my journey to King Street, I've been here three years now, started before I even realized it was a journey to King Street Center. I grew up not far from Maryland in Virginia, and I am a first generation Iranian American, and so I really grew up trying to navigate the difference between what it meant to be a kid in the United States and with the expectations and cultures of being an American kid with balancing out what it meant to be a first generation Iranian kid who would have french fries at school for my lunch and then go home and have you know, Persian rice every night who had to figure out who I was um, at different points depending upon where I was. And very early on, I figured out that, uh, you know, th there was an American side to me that I really had to push for. And although you, some of you may actually know me as Beth in this room, if you've known me for a while, Shabnam is my first name, it's my given name. Um, but starting as early as kindergarten, I figured out that I needed to have a name that helped people to understand I belonged. And so I stuck with that name actually all the way until I came to King Street Center. And it gave me an opportunity to really go back to and be proud of who I am and where I came from. And I share that story with you because that's kids at King Street as well. We're talking about a lot of first generation kids who are navigating um, what it means to be from two different places at the same time, who are trying to fit into American culture but also um, hold on to their own culture. And most of my work has been in state level advocacy around children's issues. And when the opportunity to be the executive director of King Street Center came up, it felt to me as if it was the place I was meant to always get to. Um, it was the population and the community that I cared about and an opportunity to uh, advocate for that community. Cool. I'm gonna be a little audio nerd for a second. I'm gonna take this out just so we don't have to keep passing this around. And if I could ask you all just to hold the mic. Um, and so I'm gonna pass this down to you. My first question um, is for you. When we first talked, you mentioned, and, and just now you mentioned that you have moved up in this organization from being a volunteer. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, you've moved up in this organization from being a volunteer uh, to now being a, the executive director. What do you think are some of the the benefits um, and maybe the challenges of starting uh, at this organization in one job and, and moving up? What what type of knowledge does that bring with you? Yeah, as you said, it's both an opportunity as a challenge because starting as a volunteer you come in not knowing anything really about the organization. You just come in, you're excited, you care about the mission, and then you start to learn more about the different programs that they have. And then getting a job there, just as a staff member, again, you don't know what happens at the director level or program director level to actually keep things going. So you get to see a little bit from each side, and that really, is also why I decided to go after the director role, because I saw the potential. This organization has been around for 37 years now, and they have done so much to keep people alive, and really started to help people die, right? Mm -hmm. Because HIV and AIDS was terrible in the 80s. So that's what they were doing, and it went from that to now having a food pantry so people can access healthy food, they have options to feed themselves, making sure they get to their appointments. So being able to see all of that and also not understanding what the director was doing to make sure the doors were kept open and now stepping into that role, I understand some of the decision that the director was making, but at the same time also 
her being there for 30 plus years, I saw some of the, well, we just have to keep it this way. This is how we've always done it. But there was so much room to do so much more. Mm -hmm. Even though funding also changes every year, that's one of the challenges. But I feel like it's an opportunity. Someone else coming in, even though we have long-term staff members, and now we have new staff members coming on as well. Now I'm seeing the, we can do this. No, this is how we should do it. And now I'm in the middle of trying to say we can do all of it and also making sure that clients are the most important part of the work we are doing and then we can keep the mission moving forward. A number of you have mentioned that uh, you work at organizations that have only had one or two executive directors or leaders before you stepped into that role or joined the organization. Um, uh, I'm curious if anybody has, has thoughts to share on what, what that's been like. like what is the, the, the benefit of having somebody who has led an organization for 30 years? Um, what types of systems do they leave to you? And, and I'm, I'm sure what kind of vacuum uh, they leave in their wake uh, when they go. Does that bring up anything for anyone here? Um, I So I started last year um, and took over Ann Gilbert's role. She was a prevention specialist for many years in central Vermont, and um, she had relationships with everyone. <laughs> you know, I, she, I was really lucky to be able to spend about a month with her before she left doing some training and um, meeting new people, having her introduce me to people, but the institutional knowledge that she held that no one else held um, was a loss for prevention in our area just um, because of the lack of onboarding process or strategic planning for how this one person could be replaced. Um, so I was so grateful for the time that I had with her to be able to introduce me to all of these people, but I, I feel the lack of um, of knowledge that, and, and navigating grant and navigating communities and um, all of those things, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the, the role that I've stepped into. Yeah. Yeah, and I can second all of that. Um, we had co-directors for 30 of the 50 years that we've been in operation. Um, my role, as I mentioned earlier, was new three years ago when I stepped in, and three years ago we also had a new executive director. So um, a lot of it is, when you think of Mary Johnson in Middlebury, you associate it with the two co-directors that were there for so long. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, we hadn't had a strategic plan in 15 years because we did the same thing for 20 to 30 years. So there was no need to change, so um, it's, um, just kind of figuring out how to ride that fine line of keeping the tradition but also realizing that there is so much more that can be done now. Um, you know, what was possible 30 years ago is more than doable today and then some and we need to consider the changing dynamics and diversity of the economy as we, you know, progress forward. So. It's been a challenge to kind of change the mindset of people, I think, um, in the community and in the organization of this is where we are now and this is where we're trying to get forward. I'm actually kind of, I have a pretty big team here today and I, I almost want them to answer <laughs> this question for me, but um, I, when I started three years ago, I came after not just one, but two pretty strong, um, impactful women who led the organization. And King Street Center was established in 1971. And I'm the, as most people are aware of, third, maybe fourth in the early days, executive director in that 50 plus year history. Wow. Which is, uh, you know, a big change. The executive director, Vicki Smith, before me, was the program director for about 15 years before moving into being the executive director for another 15 years. And then she never filled that program director role for quite some time. So the organization, I would argue, was under her leadership for, for a significant period of its history. And I think maybe similar to you, you know, relationships, trying to get those relationships established. 
I remember when I first came in, we have a great board, and one of our board members decided to do uh, what they call the DISC profile. Um, and she also led a conversation a few weeks into me being there uh, with the team where they came in, they spoke with her about some of their concerns or what their experience has been so far. And then um, she came and she talked to me and gave me a summary and then I had to go back into the room with the full team and kind of respond to some of those things. And I remember one of the biggest concerns being um, that I lived in Montpelier instead of Burlington. And how could I care for the community of Burlington? What happens if something happens? Will I be there? Will I show up? And, um, and you know, I think there is also some healthy and rightfully so uh, cynicism about who am I and what do I want from this job? Is this just a career ladder job or what am I trying to do? And, you know, I spent a, I mean, I'm still doing it, but I spent a real solid first year there trying to gain people's trust after a long time beloved executive director was there. Uh, and by nature of a new executive director coming into any organization, it's a change for people. And I think there's a lot of long-time nonprofits who have been in our communities that haven't had a whole lot of change. And so it's hard. Change is really hard. And I think, you know, when you're in a director role, you might know or see things that not perhaps everybody in the organization does. And so it's really important and difficult to connect the dots for people as to why you're moving in the direction that you are. Um, and then kind of trust your own leadership that even if folks don't know everything or why, that you're doing what's best for the mission of the organization. How has this leadership transition that you've all experienced affected fundraising at your organizations? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll keep it brief because we've had the same funders. Um, if anything, we've relied on the same funders over time, and it's the same ones year after year. We applied for the same grants year after year. Um, if anything, I've taken a more progressive approach, and you know, we've got new software now to build our database and build funders and build our donors. Um, so I wouldn't say it necessarily negatively impacted me personally, um, but I look at it as an opportunity to maintain those relationships with the same donors and funders, but also progress it to the next level for our organization. I uh, came into an organization with an incredible reputation in Burlington. And everywhere I go, it's unbelievable. Somebody has a story about they volunteered at one time in their life, or they lived next to the center, or uh, they worked there. And so I was very fortunate to be able to walk into an organization that already had built into it the um, base of supporters who knew the work we did not. And I, similar to you, have been able to build on that and identify new funding sources that we didn't tap into before. Um, and to add new programs, we've added two new programs in the last year. And so um, it's not easy, I'm not gonna say it's easy. Um, but, but we've been able to maintain our funding um, from those very long-time donors, which I think is a whole different conversation because let's talk about what happens when those very long-time donors, you know, go um, go away or transition their wealth and whether or not their children will continue to support. But. Yeah, very similar to Dylan for HIV work as well. We are lucky that the state, through legislation, every year we do get level funded, but also that can change, right? It goes up, it goes down, depending on what legislation passes. So that's how really they have been running the organization for the last 11 years or so. So when funding goes up, it's great. 
but when they have to reduce funding as well, there's an impact on programming or staffing. So to be able to open the doors and making sure clients get their needs met that way, which is amazing. But I know for the last year and a half since I took over, I was able to build the relationship with those same funders because there was almost a fear of not asking them questions, right? It's, oh, here's the money. You do what you need to do with it. Be very careful. But there was no asking, oh, can I do this instead? Right? We actually need this. Clients are asking for this. Is it possible to use the money for that? And I've noticed that now there's more of an open discussion with those funders. And now also being able to go out in the community to meet people, right? Go have coffee, go have lunch with people. And usually people will say, oh, that's not a good use of your time as a director, but I think building relationship has been huge for us. And we did receive two new grants that, you know, one of them will start a whole new program and that money alone usually was our yearly funding. So it's been a huge increase for us and we'll just keep doing it. I think we've had an opportunity to consider what work we would actually like to continue doing. Um, is this work that we feel passionate about? Is this work that our staff is really interested in doing that we feel is values aligned for us? Um, and that has felt challenging, but also really good. Um, I think that that also speaks to staff retention, right? That we're talking and thinking about, are the people who are doing the work on the ground excited about the work that they're doing? Or is this just a grant that we've had for a really long time and we do it because we've had it for that long? Um, and we actually did not receive one grant that the organization that held our prevention services had had for 22 years. Um, and when I asked why, you know, I, I asked for some follow-up about why we hadn't received it, and they said, we don't have enough staff to support your knowledge, like building your knowledge to be able to do this work. You're too new to it, and we don't have the staff capacity to support your learning. Um, so that was really challenging, right? Like, how are you expecting new people to come into this field if you don't have the capacity to support the people who are entering? Yeah. Um, speaking of that support, and boards can often provide a lot of uh, support and guidance for new leaders, but those relationships can also be dicey at times. And it's it, in this time of uh, leadership transition, we're also seeing a lot of uh, transition in and out of boards. Um, and I know you all have to do some work um, uh, recruiting new board members. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. How, how do you find people in this you know, very busy and transient world to join your boards, um, and specifically people of a younger generation? Um, I'll jump in first. Um, so when I started at Mary Johnson three years ago, we had 13 members on our board. This year, we started our year September 1st with six board members. Um, and I, you know, I challenge, I often ask, you know, is it the field of work working at a school where, you know, children are constantly moving on to the next level and a good majority of our board is parents? Um, so is it always going to be revolving, or um, is it, was it the change in leadership? Um, so I find it tough, and it, we're always looking, always seeking out, not just parents, but the community, but um, it is very tough to find, not just find, but retain quality board members. Um, so it's been a very challenging time. Yeah. We had um, a, our fel a fellow member organization of the Vermont Network Against uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence come visit us last week, HopeWorks. Um, and we had this moment where we were talking about the responses that people give to us when we tell them that we work in rape prevention uh, or rape crisis. And we made bingo out of this. Like, what are the responses that you get? The faces of like, oh. <laughs> um, or just silence, or, oh my God, I could never do that. And so, you know, when we're thinking about the folks that we're recruiting, that is often such a huge factor in it, of people either misunderstanding our work or, 
um, believing that it will be a heavy emotional lift. Um, that's really hard. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to recruit people um, when what you're asking of them is, is really challenging emotional work. Um, and so we have a really great board. Um, we have a new uh, chair of our board as of this year after someone who had been our chair for a number of years. Um, so we are also experiencing some transition. But um, you know, as, as we're looking towards the future, it, I do have questions about how we bridge that gap of it's a lot of emotional labor to do work for us. Um, at, at the end of the day, when you're not being paid for that and when you have kids to get home to, how, how can we support our board members in, in doing what needs to be done? Wait, how do you do it? <laughs> um, we, have, we have an annual meeting every year where we you know, spend most of the day together. We, we spend a lot of, we, we work hard to have in-person meetings. I think that that's one of the things. Um, I, I can't speak as much to that because that's not necessarily my role at the organization, but you know, we have a lot of events and our board members show up to volunteer at those and you know, build that spirit of community between all of us. So I think it is very much relationship-based. That's definitely been the challenge for me. When I came on, we had six board members and we were able to go up to nine at one point and now that's I have four and a half right now. <laughs> and it's, you know, I have three board members right now that are newer to the board, maybe the last six months or so. But it's amazing to see how they show up. And we're also at a place where there's a shift happening in the organization, leadership wise and program, programming wise as well. Because HIV itself is just not in the news anymore, nobody's talking about it, nobody's asking about it. When I tell people where I work, even in Brattleboro now, the response is, oh, you guys are still around? I did a thing for you in 95 or something like that. So how do we get back in the community, let people know we are still doing amazing work, and also letting them know that there is a new challenge that we are facing, right? Through prevention, now we are doing work on harm reduction and substance use and overdose. So we are getting more attraction from people who care about that, So, which is a good thing for us. But the board piece in Brattleboro now, directors are asking other directors, hey, do you want to be on my board? And I can be on your board? Because it's such a small town. And it's just not a great model of governance for nonprofit at all. So, but. Um, I have a very supportive board and what the board wanted from me as an executive director was very different than the expectations of the executive director before me. And that, that has been a complicated thing to navigate, um, especially as a first time executive director myself. And um, part of the reason that the board chose me as the executive director is because of the equity lens that I bring to the organization. So you can imagine you got a board who hired you because of that lens, and now you're the lead of the organization, and you have to apply that lens to the board. And, <laughs> and um, how tricky that can be, uh, because supporting something in theory and, and then implementing it are not always seamless to each other. And I remember very early on, because I tend to be more of like a jump in and bulldog and then back up and go, whoop, that was not a good idea. And <laughs> I and that and you know that's what I did. We kind of like went in hard on equity training and went did the equity training and then sat in the middle of the equity training and shit, oh shit, like I shouldn't have done this equity training at this moment. Um, and so it has been a real interesting, I think, evolution because there, I think there's a fundamental question as like, what, what is the board's role, really? And what do the staff understand the role's board to be? And how is that different than what the executive director or the board understands its role to be? And um, we, you know, we lost some ad hoc members, some major donors on the board because of some of the equity work. Um, and there's, there's still supporters, but they left the committees and 
yeah, I had this as a new executive director moment of like, uh oh, am I going to be able to do this? Are we really going to be able to transition the board? Um, we've had a lot of success having our staff increase representation of the kids we serve. We went from somewhere around six to nine percent of BIPOC staff to a little over sixty percent BIPOC staff in three years. And the board is not quite, yeah, pretty awesome. <laughs> We have increased the diversity of the board as well. Uh, and it's really tricky because BIPOC folks haven't always had the opportunities to gain the skills of what it looks like and what it means and what is needed of a board member. And so it's really difficult to bring on BIPOC folks because you don't want to tokenize people. And I've had, you know, there's, I've seen organizations that have driven real fast into trying to diversify their board. And then all the BIPOC people leave. And they go, well, what happened? And I, I am a big believer in you have to create the conditions for BIPOC people to be on a board before you bring them on the board. And so I would argue that what we've been doing, and we do have a pretty solid representation of BIPOC folks on the board as well, but what we've been doing is creating the conditions first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, w I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, generational divides that exist at many of our organizations, um, including my own. The last couple of years have, have brought uh, to newsrooms around the country a lot of um, uh, shifts in expectations, uh, shifts in the way that we cover news, the ways in which uh, people are expected or not expected to bring their own personal identities and backgrounds to the work that they do. Um, and I am curious to hear about that for, for each of you, especially for folks who are taking over from uh, an older generation uh, and managing people who might be of a younger generation. Um, and uh, there's lots of different expectations about how often you're in the office, um, whether getting coffee is a good use of time, um, how, <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of differences. Um, how have those shown up for you, maybe with the board or your, your staff? Um, how, how do you manage those, those generational differences and what work means? And it, oh, sorry, one more thing. I just, did I remember when we were on our Zoom, you uh, had a very cute baby with you. So, and also as a parent myself, I'm curious, uh, yeah, how, how those other demands outside of work can affect uh, demands inside work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'll answer that first. Um, you really learn how to run on, like, no sleep. <laughs> um, so it, it is more demanding, I would say, because I can't put in the extra hours um, you know, I can't work the 45, 50 hours anymore. So it is more, you know, not going to get coffee sometimes, but sitting down and doing work to make sure everything gets done. So I, I can still have that personal balance. Um, but to go back to the other question um, with the generational, I'm still by far the youngest person on our administrative team of five of us. And while it was never in my job description, um, I am now our tech person. <laughs> um, and, and to me, that is the biggest challenge. Um, and it's not like I know much about it. It's just having the conversations of, you know, we can do this. We don't have to write everything down. We don't have to file everything. We just need to get the systems in place to do it at a more efficient pace. Um, and I think it's just, if you do something for so long, um, you know, everybody in our office has been there 20 plus years and they've been doing it the same exact way for 20 plus years and it, it is sometimes having you know, repetitive conversations but <laughs> continuing to teach and continuing to show and, and hope that it sticks. Um, but I would say that's, that's the biggest shift for me. Is, Do we need a breakout <laughs> session? <laughs> How to run the printers. Yeah. 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 That'll be the So I have some people for you. <laughs> Um, we have a relatively young organization, actually. Um, I think the place where I find it um, 
I most notice it is actually with our funders. Um, you know, and especially for folks that I'm doing reporting to. Um, I will say, because we do, we have a young staff, um, some of the shifts of like, what is the role of the organization in your life have been really interesting for us to have. Like, what, what, is, the, what is your job? And it's a job, so how are you doing your job? Um, versus what is the expectation of the needs that the organization is supposed to meet for you? And I think particularly for our, our kind of youngest members, this, you know, and this, isn't, this is not a criticism, it's the systems and structures that were in place that supported folks previously don't exist anymore. And so if you have to get your health insurance through your job and you need to be able to take time off to take care of your you know, aging parents and um, you have, you know, can't afford childcare, this, the tension of what's the organization's role, especially a values aligned mission, right? Like where we're trauma informed and we're really trying to see the humanity in our clients. And, you know, how do we, how do we bridge that need for us to do the work that we've agreed to do and are contractually obligated to do and to help people and to do the work that we'd like to do um, and also to take care of the people who work for us. But it's really, it's really hard. Yeah. Same thing and I would say the first year since I took over getting all my APM was regular for me because we are in a service-based work, right? So people come in, they have their needs, and everything is an emergency, even when it's not, right? They, they will call, you know, the AIDS project will take care of this for me. And that's what they know, it's not their fault, that's what they've been used to. And the director was also doing the service work, was the HR person. The phone is not working right now, one of the staff person yesterday, <coughs> my phone is not working. Okay, I'll take a look at it, I'll figure it out. My computer is not charging. Okay, I will see what I can do. So the director was everything and still is everything. And then trying to move away from that and also setting up systems, right, for reporting. So we don't have to email each other 10 times when I need to get this thing. There's something called Google Docs. It's amazing. <laughs> it actually works, right? Trying to bring that in. And timesheets, even though that's a simple thing, there's no understanding that if I don't get this time sheet to put it on this grant, we can all be in trouble. So it's really, it's, it's a challenge, but with the new stuff that's coming on, they, you know, they get it, They'll, they figure it out. They don't come to me for every single thing. So trying to manage that and having them work together so they can teach each other, right? Like, oh, we used to do it this way, but you were teaching me this new thing. Can we figure out how to make this easier for the whole organization, not just for ourselves? But that still is a challenge, and I'm working on that, and you know, delegating more so people understand that it's a job, right? So if you do your job, then I don't have to do it as well. Then we can all go home, right? You get to go home on time, but I have to stay here until 8 because I have to do your job, and then now I'm doing my job after you go home. So how can we just work together so that everyone can have a balanced life outside of this work? And one more quick thing. In terms of generational shifts, something that's really, I don't think this is unique within our industry, but the average turnover for an advocate right now is a year and a half. Um, so we're, we're not generating new leadership in the same way also because we're not getting to build skills and knowledge for folks because the work is doesn't pay enough and it's too emotionally challenging so you know as we're also thinking about the future <coughs> addressing that turnover and you know creating conditions for new leadership to emerge is is really critical um i'm an old millennial and so it can be very confusing as to where I fit in the spectrum of things. I am the person who, when I started my career, wouldn't take a single day off that first year um, for fear of that making it look like I wasn't going to be good at my job, right? And we have around 33 people or so on staff, and 
probably around half of them are early career, and then the other half are much later career. We've got people who just started, um, and from time they're in any professional situation, all the way to people who've been there 30 years. And um, and I'm, I sort of sit in the, in the middle of that, and I think maybe similar over to you around the, how do you take care of people, but also how do you ensure that you're executing your mission can be a very difficult thing in an industry that wasn't set up to do that. We are an industry that is set up to take care of other people, not ourselves. And so, you know, if there's anything that's going to make it likely that I'm not going to remain an executive director at all, this organization or otherwise, is because this is an unrealistic job. It's a job where you are working all of the time where you, when you know, I've got three young kids, 12 and under, and there are weeks I'm not home, they won't see me for four of the nights. So um, I think fundamentally there's a shift we need to make. And the good thing about the, the youngest generation coming into the workforce is that they're saying, no, no, not me. I'm not doing that. And um, and you can't make me. <laughs> I might be an employee, but you can't make me. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's so much to learn from that. At the same time, because I believe two things can be true at the same time. Um, that is really hard as an employer. It is really hard to have people who are like, yeah, but you know, um, I, I need a, I need a day for myself, right? Or I need a mental health day. When you are an organization that is, you need those people to show up to serve your community. And so it's really hard to hold both the, um, we need to take care of people, which really is the younger generation of workers pushing on us to do, with the, yeah, but I also need you to show up because we quite literally can't open if you don't. And what does that mean for our community? Um, and then on top of all of that, you've got this model that's an executive director um, that is supposed to be everywhere and everything when it's a completely unrealistic model when you're not getting paid very much. And you are not incentivized to increase your salary. <laughs> because then you have to raise that money. <laughs> so I went to the board, I'm like, it's fine, it's fine. Don't do it. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, so as we talk about recruitment and retention, um, I'm curious what's going to keep you for doing this work. Um, and I'm hoping we could approach that by... Um, the, the question that Mr. Rogers always asks, which is, uh, uh, who are the helpers? Look for the helpers. I wonder if you could just uh, tell us about one person uh, in your life, uh, could be personal life or in your career, who has uh, is, is part of the reason why you're able to do what you do, either through um, supporting you, transferring knowledge, uh, teaching, guiding you. Uh, who, who is that person for you? Um, for me, it was, um, as I mentioned, I worked at a summer camp, a nonprofit for at-risk youth, um, when I was still trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do after college. Um, and for me, it was the person that did the organization's HR, the grant writing, the advocacy work for the children. Um, we built a very close relationship um, and still talk to this day, even though she's retired. But um, I think as somebody that didn't know anything about the nonprofit industry, um, when I started there, um, the amount she was willing to share just because she cared so much about the community and knew that it was important to grow the sector and um, to pass down this knowledge. So for me, whenever I have a question, and it still comes up, um, especially in the state contracts, so what is this and why am I doing this? Um, I still reach out to her and say, do you know what this is and why they may be asking it and how to answer it? And she still walks me through this stuff. So for me, um, her name's Monica Zuloff, if anybody knows her, she's 
big into nonprofits in New Hampshire. Um, but for me, that's the person, and I, I gleaned so much knowledge from her. Um, I never had a mentor in any of the nonprofit jobs that I've had. And uh, my first nonprofit leadership role, I was 25 and they hired me to be the executive director of a boys and girls club. And I had no business doing that. Um, like, none. Um, and I made $26,000 a year for what was supposed to be a part-time job. Uh, it was not. Um, and I failed really miserably. And so then I didn't work for nonprofits for a while. Um, and then when I came back, um, you know, I, I, I literally don't, I've never had a mentor. I've never had anybody in the nonprofit sector who sat me down and was like, this is how you do things, here are the skills that you need to learn. Um, I think w one of the things that's helping me right now, I, I'm actually, I'm taking prerequisite classes right now to go back to school um, so that I can get my nursing license. Um, and the reason that I'm doing that is because I already feel like I'm doing community health nursing, but I don't have the degree. And so I'm staying in the field by going back and getting a degree that will, one, help me make more money, and two, help me become a different kind of leader than I am right now. Um, but, you know, I've never had a job that helped me pay for education. I've, you know, I, professional development money is really limited. Um, so I'm not sure that I have a person. I think I'm like here just because of like sheer stubbornness. You are the person. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I would say the same thing. I don't think I have one person that I could say really sat me down and say, this is how you're supposed to do it even throughout the transition, which took like a year, right? So that tells you how much work needed to be done for me to finally step in. But just reaching out and building a network, right? I have friends that are also directors, and they have been doing this work way longer than I have. So asking them, how do you do it? What does your policy look like? Can I see it? Re reading their policy, looking at our policies, trying to update our policies, right? And I think I see one of them in the room here, Ruben, who runs United Way, Wyndham Condi, right? He's one of them also. So really just building a network. And I was go going to school for my master's last year in nonprofit law and management course. And she really, her and her husband, they have been helping a lot, right? They check in once in a while. And this year she made her class do a class project for the AIDS project. Because she's like, we are going to help you. You need help. So we'll do a project for you. But her and her husband, and he used to operate a retreat farm down in Prowlboro. So they check in once in a while just to see how you were doing. And then based on that, they'll give me advice if needed. But yeah, I don't, I don't have one person really guiding me. This is just me seeing that there's an opportunity for the AIDS project to do so much more right now, and I'm willing to go down that road. Thank you. Uh, well, I have to say on the personal front, if I didn't have a supportive partner who let me not show up four nights in a row, uh, then it would be an impossible job to do. Uh, so, you know, a lot of credit to him for that. I don't think he actually realized just how much it was going to be when he agreed I take the role. Um, but in addition to that, even on the days where I'm like, what in the world am I doing and why did I do this? If I can sit down with some of the teens that come to the center, it's a real important reminder as to why. And in some ways, I would argue that they're, they're going to be what they are what keep me at King Street. They're going to be the reason when we start a new program and I watch the video and those kids say, I don't know why King Street didn't do this before, but thank God they're doing it now. You know, that, that will keep me at the center. Um, the last thing I'll just say is echoing that there are not enough opportunities for mentorship 
for executive directors of nonprofits in Vermont. And then you take that down additional layers. There's not enough opportunity for mentorship for BIPOC executive directors. Uh, there are not enough opportunities for mentorship of women stepping in to executive director roles. Um, there are so many ways in which we're just thrown in and told, figure it out, um, that it is probably what will eventually get people to leave the sector. So we create our own networks, we create our own you know, um, ED communities to <coughs> try to think about and talk with each other. Uh, but for the funders in the room, it would be <laughs> lovely for there to be some sort of organized uh, communities for leaders, especially when you think about identities-based communities. Thank you. Well, we're nearing the end of our time, so I just want to, to wrap up here by sincerely thanking each of our panelists for being vulnerable up here, for sharing your stories, your organizations, and your careers, and giving us, I think, some really uh, useful tidbits to bring with us through the rest of today. Maybe we'll start a whole mentorship support network out of this first Common Good conference. Um, so Sultana, Dylan, Samba, and Shamnam, thank you so much. start our day. Um, let's give it up one more time for our panelists and moderator. Thank you all for um, And now before we head off to our first breakouts, since this might be the last time I have you all in the room together, I just want to call your attention to a QR code on the back of your program um, that asks, how did we do today? And I just want to shout out that we would really like your feedback on today's event. Um, so that we can make next year's even better. So please take the time to fill that out um, after today's event. Um, and so now we're gonna head out into our first breakout sessions. As a reminder, you can attend any session. You're not tied to the one you registered for, but space is limited. So if you see a session full sign on the door, um, please just choose another session. They're all fabulous. Um, and then there's a breakout schedule in your program, um, as well as a venue map to help you find where you're going. If you're going to the deciphering community demographics, you're going to be headed across the street to the Capitol Theater. Um, and the sessions today are on three floors of the hotel. And the elevator has limited capacity, so if you're able to take the stairs, we do encourage you to do so. Um, so that's all for now. Let's go out there, and we'll see you back here in the ballroom for lunch. 